Indianapolis Motor Speedway and Ferrari. Two true legends come together for the second year in a row as this is the third round of the 2020 Ferrari Challenge North America Championship at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Creamer. We'll be joined by Ryan Moraine doing double duty down in the pits in the grid and post-race interviews. will be joining me in the booth as well as we have this beautiful shot above the legendary, iconic pagoda and looking over the grounds of this legendary racing venue. Just an amazing facility, 1909. When it came into existence, the idea was conceived, and it then joined a list of remarkable tracks, and Ferrari Challenge races on many of them. Daytona, Road Atlanta, and Indianapolis now happening this weekend, end of August, Circuit of the Americas, end of September, WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, mid-October, Watkins Glen, and then the finale of Mundiali at Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, just an incredible schedule for Ferrari Challenge North America. Here's where we're racing this weekend. If you're not quite familiar with where Indianapolis is, it's right in the heartland of the United States. And it has been such a special place for so many years. Over a century of racing history has been made here. And the cars are out on this track. It is using the infield road course. So when you go down the front straight, you're running in the opposite direction as you would for the Indy 500, running clockwise into a very tight first turn, then a quick left-right into a very important turn four, leads through that quick left-right flick onto the longest sec second longest straight, the longest on the infield, the Holman Boulevard straightaway, into a very tight turn seven. Then the quick S's up into the crucial turn 10 through the high-speed 11, hard-breaking for 12, then position the car right for 13, and pin it coming through 14 to get yourself a good lap. Qualifying in the books, it is race time at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And the cars are out for the Trofeo Pirelli race. Features two different divisions, the Trofeo Pirelli drivers and then the Trofeo Pirelli AM drivers. And uh, they are all racing together here in what is essentially the sixth race of the championship. Each of the rounds of double header weekend. And they are out now for what they call their installation laps, where they're able to get out and run a couple of laps before they head into the pits and grid up to make their way out onto the racing facility itself uh, for race time as it comes up. And uh, we've been blessed with a couple of absolutely beautiful days here. And it's a little warmer today than it was yesterday at this time. It's about 84 degrees. And the real feel, though, with a little bit of humidity in the air, takes us up to 96 degrees right now in terms of how it feels out there in the pit and paddock area. And as I said, every one of these races are indeed double header races. And let's go back and take a look at action from the first of the races. Yesterday, Cooper McNeil was on pole comfortably. Jordan Workman in that black machine to his left, right of the screen. Cooper getting a great start, and it was Rashi West able to come down the inside. But as you can see, cars everywhere where they rejoin bits and pieces of carbon fiber flying, and that would have implications in the race. Here's a good look at the impressive Aaron Weiss. He was under attack for most of the race and under physical attack from Jason McCarthy. Just got in a little too hot and broke Jason's car. Aaron getting no respite, though, as here comes Joe Rubo way down to the inside. Aaron reads it perfectly, does the over-under to perfection, and accelerates away. Meanwhile, Cooper McNeil had driven off into a bit of a distance here, absolutely focused after not winning here in either of the races last year and getting at least one in the books. And for Aaron Weiss, he felt more pressure again. The battle for the podium fierce behind him, Alfred Kaiola and the 67 getting together. That was John Horsch. Kyola a little optimistic in an attack on him. And here, Jean-Claude Sada getting by Dave Musial, who was pole sitter and leader. Musial able to stake, take that corner back, but then watch what happens here. Sada, too hot into turn number 10, runs a little wide, and that gave Musial a little breathing room. For Vice, he was under attack again from Holden, but he was able to hang on. Cooper McNeil getting the win. And uh, just an amazing run. And uh, again, Dave Musial winning in the AM category. But there were huge battles for position throughout the field. That battle for the podium with Aaron Weiss in the AM category was just superb. And Rosh West, who ended up with a second-place finish, actually had a piece of carbon fiber lodged in his Pirelli 
uh, race tire, and they were stunned that it uh, held air. It tells you just how good these Pirelli tires are in terms of being sturdy as well as grippy and fast, and he was able to hang on for a second-place finish even with that unfolding. So the field now done with the installation laps, being brought in and getting ready to get underway again. 30-minute timed race uh, for these two categories of drivers in these beautiful cars. The cars in all four of the categories in Ferrari Challenge are identical, and now they are the new 488 Challenge Evo category of car. Enhanced downforce, particularly on the front of the car. Sculpting of air movement in, through, and around the car. Uh, looking after it, a new Pirelli tire, which Ross U.S. proved just how good it is. Uh, this uh, was an amazing series in the past couple of years with the 488 Challenge car, the original one, and somehow these Ferrari engineers have taken this car and made it better still. And there is the overall pole sitter, and it, did he put in a run in qualifying? He did yesterday as well, was able to drive off to the lead, but he also was kind enough to give us a look from the driver's seat of this amazing track here at Indianapolis. Cooper McNeil here, driver of the number 63 WeatherTech Racing Ferrari Challenge Evo car. Let's go for a lap around Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So here we are at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in our number 63 WeatherTech Racing Ferrari Evo Challenge car. Coming on the front straight here, it's important to start the lap with a lot of full throttle to maximize the speed down this long straightaway. There we are across the bricks, the famous Indy bricks. Going into turn one, looking for the 500 board, trying to get to the 500 board to hit the brakes. All the way down to third gear, very heavy brake zone into turn one here at Indy Motor Speedway. A lot of horsepower in this car, so it's better to stay up a gear than to be sliding the rears around. Turn two, turn three, going into turn four now, a bit of understeer. So I try to get as much curbing uh, as I can possibly take there without upsetting the car. Here we are flat through turn five and six, the quick chicane onto the middle straight here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Up through the gears, listening to the twin turbo V8 behind me. Down to the 500 brake marker, all the way down to third gear, one of the slowest corners on the racetrack. It's important to get the car all the way to the right side and brake straight in a straight line for turn nine here. Use all the curbs, turn 10, all the curbs as well. And rolling on the throttle here, trying to maximize the exit speed here, but a little difficult with the damp patches we had this morning. In the dry, this particular area on the racetrack is flat, but as you can see, it's still damp and we have a bit of uh, traffic here. Catch this yellow car, but thankfully he lets me by, turning in for turn 13. And it's important to stay, get a little oversteer there, it's important to stay left here to maximize the speed again onto the front straight straightaway here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. A busy lap, a quick lap, but a fun one here at Indy Motor Speedway. It is indeed. It uh, is challenging. And sometimes you look at a track map and you think of Indianapolis and you think, well, this is going to be flat. Uh, but they have designed it with great challenges. And every driver to a person has absolutely loved coming here and having the experience, one, of racing at Indianapolis and also then are just impressed with the challenges that this track presents. So many key areas on this track. Well, it is time for us to get serious in terms of getting ready to go racing, and that means, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to honor our country. Please, it is time for our national anthem.
Indeed, Jean-Claude Sada appreciating the majesty and the pageantry of this moment, the national anthem at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Down amongst that field of absolutely glorious racing machinery and great pilots, uh, Pilates is none other than Ryan Marine. Ryan, what have you got on some of these drivers? Well, Greg, it's a pleasure to be here. A beautiful racetrack, a beautiful venue to go racing, and one guy to keep an eye on might just be Joe Rubo. He'll start fourth in Trofeo Pirelli. He will start sixth overall, and frankly did not have a, the kind of day he was expecting yesterday. And I had a chance to speak to him earlier about how he plans to put that disappointment behind him looking ahead to race number two in just a few moments. Joe Rubo, unfortunately, race one on Saturday, not the results you were looking for. So how do you reset the mind, focus on Sunday, and get the best result that you can? Yeah, I mean, that's actually the benefit of the two-day race weekend, right? You get to go out, do your best on Saturday, and then try to do better on Sunday. So yesterday, I made a very bad start. Uh, so I have to correct that today. Um, and just go out and try to do my best. You gotta put it behind you. Today's a new day, and you gotta go out and just try to do better. Obviously, the other benefit of a two race weekend is it means a second race here at this track. Indianapolis is a special place. What does it mean to you very, very to special get to place. race here? You know, uh, it's my first time here. I've never been at this track before. I didn't make last year's race. Um, but you know, you grow up watching the Indy 500 and you know, Rooting for Mario Andretti and Bobby Unser and all these guys and, you know, the big spin and all that. You know, you remember all that stuff. And uh, you come here and you want to do your best. So it's a, it's a really, really special place. It's an honor for Ferrari North America to get us here and uh, give us amateurs a chance to be at the world-famous place. It's an amazing opportunity. Good luck today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks to keep an eye on. We'll be starting right alongside Joe at the start. That's Dave Musial. He already is a race winner going back to yesterday, but he starts second today, and it was an intense duel. It was less than a second, in fact, between first and second yesterday. Had a chance to chat with Dave as well about what he expects here in the second race of the weekend. Dave Musial, what a great battle you had in race one with JC yesterday. Just able to keep him behind you. First of all, let's go back and look back at that race. How did you manage to keep him in your rear-facing camera? We can't say rear-view mirror these days, can we? No, you can't say that. Um, I kept him in the rear camera. I was kind of doing a little bit of tire management and distance between me and him. So my coach was staying on the radio telling me he's 1.2 seconds, he's 1 second, he's 1.2. So I tried to keep around a 1 to 1.5 second distance from him and manage my tire wear and hope that him chasing me, he would have aggressively wore down his tires and he'd fall back even further. It's a different starting position here in race number two today. He's got the pole, you're gonna be chasing him. How does that change your philosophy going into the race? I'll be honest with you, I like being the fox, not the rabbit. Um, I prefer chasing, I don't prefer leading. Uh, it's a lot of pressure, so uh, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, Of course, I would have liked to get the extra point, but you know, I, I had a little bobble in uh, three. I had a little TC issue with my car. I had to reset something. Uh, but, you know, the race will uh, tell the story. Already a race winner this weekend here at Indianapolis State Mutual. Good luck. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ryan. And we have word the field is ready. It is time to get this race underway for that most special command in racing. Please welcome the president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Doug Bowles. On behalf of Roger Pinsky and everybody at Pinsky Entertainment and Indianapolis Motor Speedway fans around the world, drivers, start your Ferrari engines. Ah, and he did it with some gusto. Absolutely fantastic as this field will now come to life. These beautiful 670 plus horsepower turbo V8s in the back of these beautiful 488 challenge machines will be springing to life. The grid will be clearing. And the field will be heading out on their pace lap as we are getting ready for this second race of the doubleheader weekend to unfold. And, of course, the basically the sixth race of the 2020 championship this weekend unfolding after a forced four-month hiatus. And it is so sweet 
to be back and hearing these beautiful Ferrari machines. And at such a legendary venue at that as the field is set and ready to go here for the Trofeo Pirelli and Trofeo Pirelli Am round number two of the weekend as the field starts to move off under the control of the glorious F8 Tributo, the official safety car for the weekend. And look at that. They roll over the legendary yard of bricks. You feel that little thump, thump. As you head out of pit lane, you know something special is on the cards today as they head out onto the track for the pace lap. Let's take a look now at the starting lineup. And again, Cooper McNeil on the pole in the Ferrari Westlake, that beautiful white machine. Joining him on that front row, uh, Ross West for Boardwalk Ferrari, the number 25. We move to the second row, and it will feature Jordan Workman, Ferrari of Central Florida, the 21, the 61, Jean-Claude Sada, the Boardwalk Ferrari, pole in the AM category. Dave Musial next up for Ferrari Lake Forest, then Joe Rubo, then Aaron Weiss, third qualifier in the AM category, and uh, he is joined by Christopher Cagnazzi, then Brian Davis and Alfred Kiowa. Then next up, it'll be Brent Holden and Jason McCarthy in a backup car. So Jason actually goes to the back of the field for this one. So John Horsch and Brian Kaminsky, who we understand Brian will not be able to make the start today. He is apparently suffering. It is a non-racing related wrist injury that uh, is just aggravating him to the point that he just doesn't feel he can muscle through it here. And uh, if you know Brian, that's telling something. That obviously must be sore. So he has had to withdraw. So... And again, for Jason McCarthy, his car damaged in an incident in turn one yesterday, and it was not repairable. He's in a uh, spare car, a teammate's car, and all of these cars are technically identical. Uh, each car has its little idiosyncrasies, of course, and the setup, and getting that setup translated over. Uh, Jason uh, is going to be dealing with that as this race unfolds. Love this video drone shot here, right on top of these cars, following that glorious F8 Tributo. As they work their way around, this is through turn 11 now. And as I said, you get this little bit of banking, and right as you turn in, it flattens out and falls away. As, well, as we said, might be the only off-camber turn on this track. And uh, then this incredibly important thir turn 13, 14 complex. And at speed, you've got to be very precise in your placement. The Tributo heads into pit lane. The field now under the control of Cooper McNeil alongside Ross Schwest as they work their way through turn 14 and up onto the long front stretch here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway and looking for a green flag. Cooper going for six straight wins from his six straight pole. We'll see if he's able to pull it off. Watch for the green. It flies. The clock starts. We are racing at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And Cooper noses in, into the lead. Boy, Ross would have loved to have been able to do something to sneak around. Not quite able to pull that off. Oh, and there's pressure. A touch. Ross goes around. Jordan Workman got that curb and just bounced him over, tipped him into Ross. And Ross went around. So for the second day in a row, Ross feels the effects of turn one. Yesterday, it wasn't contact. It was debris in his tire. Today, it was contact as we watch the number nine of Alfred Kaiola as he works his way through this quick left-right flick and onto the Holman straightaway. And Ryan Marine already, Cooper McNeil has stretched that margin just a little bit. And we talked about it. I heard you talk about it, in fact, in qualifying, how good he is at just going out and laying down a lap early. That's good in qualifying. It's great in the race. There you see Jordan just clipping that curb, just barely touching Ross, but it was enough to get Ross to rotate. Great evasive driving by everybody behind there to uh, not create any further contact. Yeah, really good job. That is a difficult corner, as we talked about some yesterday. It funnels down. It's so wide on entry, you think you can make it work, and next thing you know, you've run out of racing room. So now Rosh West has his work cut out coming from dead last through the field. And you can see Joe Rubo, uh, who you uh, talked a little bit about. Joe, again, not getting a great start. He had a problem with the rev limiter yesterday. And uh, he has dropped off just a little bit. Looking through the field here as they come up onto the front straight. Once again, it's McNeil over Workman, Sada and Musial together. And then right behind Musial is Chris Cagnazzi. Runs a little wide into turn one. Now, Chris not in the AM category. 
So he's right now sort of a buffer between that Sada Musio battle, Ryan, and the Vice, Kayola, and Horsch battle in the AM category right now. Yeah, he'd love to get up past those two AM cars that are up ahead of him. He's got that final spot on the podium in class in Trofeo Pirelli. He'd love to chase down Workman and McNeil, but they're a ways up the road at this point. Yeah, they've opened up a bit of a margin. We're going to go back here. There is Musio, and uh, he's truly one of the great characters in this paddock. He's passionate as it gets, and uh, he's one of those guys that uh, started with a small, uh, bought his dad's, actually, uh, HVAC company, HVAC air conditioning and heating company that was run out of the home and has grown it into one of the biggest companies uh, in North America and uh, has a passion for Ferraris, and this is how he uh, gets out there and uh, exercises that passion just a little bit. But right now, Sada has been able to just open up just a smidge of a margin, and I loved how Musial said, I'd rather be the fox than the rabbit. Well, he's the fox right now. He is. He's got to get on his giddy-up, though, if he's going to chase down Sada. JC's had a great start here, and I know from chatting with him earlier today, he thought... Winning the pole would be a big advantage, getting out in front, laying down some fast laps. Uh, he was really quick, just couldn't get oh, yeah. the pass done yesterday. Finished within a second of usual, and nevertheless, uh, you know, was right there nipping at his heels. And so now with some clean air, maybe he can run away a little bit. Well, Sada's drive yesterday was made all the more remarkable when we discovered that he had diff serious diffuser yeah. damage in that incident in turn one. So that when he overran turn 10, you could see he just didn't have the stick and uh, just uh, overshot it a little bit. And now with a completely healthy Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo, he's showing what he's made of. Yeah, no question. As we look at this battle here, that is Rubo working on Holden that's out of class, but trying to, to make some some progress here so he can get back up to Cagnazzi. I know he'd love to be back on the podium, if possible, uh, Rubo. He, he wanted to have a better start, uh, not quite the way he drew it up, I'm afraid. Yeah, unfortunately, and for right behind Rubo was Brian Davis, who, uh, after having an absolutely superb run at Road Atlanta, we know Brian's got serious pace, just hasn't quite been there for him in a decent qualifying here today, uh, but has dropped back a couple of spots at this point. And uh, then, of course, watching at the very back, the 15 of Jason McCarthy uh, in that brand-new car to him, uh, and then Ross West trying to come back after that tip uh, going at the end of the start of this race here. Ross will have the bit firmly bet uh, between his teeth. I tell you, I'm impressed here as Aaron Weiss uh, is just easing away a little bit right now from uh, Alfred Kyola. And Weiss, he never had one moment's rest in yesterday's race. Every time he would see off a challenge from one person, uh, he'd end up with another guy coming up and rattling him just a little bit. And he never, that car never looked particularly stuck to the racetrack, but Aaron was just up on the wheel and did a brilliant job of fending everybody off. Yeah, we spent some time talking about that. The car does not look particularly stable, but some drivers that plays to their style, and he might very well be one of those because he, he had many challengers over the course of that <laughs> race, did. and he had an answer for just about every one. Oh, big move here down into turn seven, not quite enough as uh, Brent Holden was thinking about trying to get down the inside of Hojo, John Horsch, in that red number 67. Couldn't quite make that stick, but showing Holden being racy, but up in front of them, Vice and Kyola side by side as they went into turn 10. Somehow Kyola got down underneath them, but uh, Vice a little bit quicker line at the exit and was able to move back in front here. But Alfred Kyola is a man on a mission right now. Yeah, really on a charge here. And, and for Vice, Aaron, I, I got to believe he's got to be thinking, what do I have to do to get some laps just by myself? Let me get in a rhythm a little bit here. This is the second day in a row. Got a nice run there, as we saw from him yesterday, out of 13 and 14 and able to build a gap headed into one. Well, you can see what happens when you have somebody attacking you and you're in your mirror just a little bit. Look at the margin now that Kegnazzi has opened up uh, over Vice. It quickly has ballooned up to about two and a half seconds. And you can see the queue that's forming up now behind Vice, Paola, Horsch, Holden, that group right now, uh, just because 
uh, when you're battling with somebody, sometimes you're not driving the fastest line. Again, though, up front, Cooper McNeil in short order up to over a five-second lead, this time over Jordan Workman. I think what's been so impressive about Cooper here this weekend, and my understanding is this is kind of his M.O., he's done this with minimal track time. He has not put a lot of stress on the car, on the components, just gone out, done the requisite number of laps, and no more, no chance no chance is taken effectively for Cooper McNeil, and uh, he's been awfully fast as we drop back and, and take a look here at Workman. Yeah, he has a real tendency, you know, and it, at, on a normal race weekend, you start the race on the tires you qualify on, so that plays into his M.O. beautifully when he minimizes the time on the tires in qualifying and has a lot left in the race. This weekend, that's not the case. After that long break, they've decided to let the driver start the race on a new set of tires and allotted a new one. But for Cooper, it still means, as you said, he's just got a lot less stress on all the components of the car. And uh, he wants a car that's not just fast, he wants it to last. Exactly. That's what he was talking to me about earlier in the weekend. That was his focus for sure. Nevertheless, he has been fast. His fastest yeah. lap of the race, a 126.829. I don't see anybody else under 128. So Cooper has been on his uh, on his horse here right off the off the bat. Yeah, he has indeed. Uh, the fastest lap in the AM category. We talked about Brian Davis having speed. He just hasn't been able to parlay that into results as McCarthy has gone around. He's going to get that car righted again. Uh, but Brian Davis, fastest AM race lap right now at a 128.5. And McCarthy, uh, tell you, the crew uh, doing just a superb job for him from Wide World Ferrari. Take a look at what happened here. Oh, he, I think he got just touched by Shuest. Yep, damage on Shuest's car. Yeah, definitely for Ross. That uh, is going to hold him up. And nice to see at least here that, uh, that McCarthy could get that thing turned around. Did not have a great result yesterday due to some contact and trying to rebound here in a different chassis, like you said. Yep. And he br brushed the wall in qualifying, and uh, which resulted in a big off down in turn one where uh, the car just settled on that corner when it let go and the other the brakes came or the uh, tire lifted on the other side uh, the crew getting that taken care of and uh, he was doing everything he could to hold off a very quick rush to west and the contact question now is how bad is McCarthy's car was it affected uh, back there by that contact you can see the right front of Shuest's car uh, was pretty deranged got to think that's going to have an impact. That was pretty clear. Yes. It's less clear as to what the status of McCarthy's car is. He's dropped back a little bit as a result of that contact and spin, but still plenty of time, 20 minutes and change, to try and reverse that situation. Well, I'll tell you, uh, Vice is able to put a little bit of a gap now on Alfred Kyola, and that has allowed him to drop the hammer. And he uh, just uncorked a 29 flat and has... Uh, closed up just a little bit on Cagnazzi, so this is getting interesting. Not necessarily cl a class position battle, but for Vice, it gives him that little bit of breathing you and me were talking about. I just want to drive forward for a little while. And it's uh, holding down the, the final spot on the podium at the moment in, in the AM category. He runs in third, and yeah, would love to, to move up a little bit. Uh, the mutual Sada battle up ahead has uh, gotten away from him a little bit. They're awfully close, just like they were yesterday, just in the inverse order. This time, JC showing the way. Yeah, and Horsch doing a really nice job right now, hanging on to that uh, final spot in the top five. Bolton had attacked on him a little bit, and Horsch has been able to open that margin up just a little bit. Then behind Holden, as you pointed out, is Rubo, who's fourth in the Trofeo Pirelli class, but mired back in the overall field right now, and just trying to methodically work his way up. He'll certainly have some work to do to get himself up to be able to run with Cagnazzi about five seconds. Yeah, and a bunch of cars, and that yes. might be the bigger issue, trying to make your way by. There is Dave Musial. Love that livery on the car. You can't miss it. The Joker. <laughs> Bright colors as well. It looks great up in person, and our camera crew doing a good job of getting that square in the sights. Absolutely, and Musial, that car behind him is not in his class, but Musial, you watch him. He's going to be fairly aggressive in his defense, and you always think about, okay, it's not in your class. Why don't you just let him go? Well, the reason he wants him behind him, I would think, Ryan, is he wants that buffer. Uh, he doesn't want to get Cagnazzi between himself and Sada. That helps Sada. Exactly, exactly. So they're playing 
that uh, multi-dimensional chess game that you like to talk about <laughs> and it's an apt description did you notice in the back of that shot there was a surface flag from one of the corner workers there so some debris on the track perhaps headed uh, down the Holman straight or just before so I'm going to be curious to see what might be causing that I almost wondered if maybe it didn't come off of the west that guard. was my thought that uh, left front corner there was a pretty big flap torn in it and it might have finally just released and uh, absolutely good eye on that. And, of course, it's important for everybody to note that flag, the yellow and red striped flag, uh, what it technically means is change in surface. It doesn't mean it's fluid. If anything down on the track, debris, water, anything like that, uh, is just to give the drivers a warning that you may not have quite the grip that you would like to have through this corner. Or there might be a piece of something out there. The battle shaping up here sure down is. the front straightaway. A bunch of cars in a line. There's going to be a major slipstream effect in play here. Yeah, well, and we're seeing Holden. You see, he dives low, late on the brakes. Can he get it stopped? No. So he's going to have to go through the cutout here. Remember what happened in the AM race yesterday when Lennon did this and caught Surreal Shoxy out. Holden has to be very gracious as he is. Absolutely beautifully done. Didn't dive in front of anybody. Didn't even make it appear that he might do that and everybody able to slide through but uh, Brent gave it a go and uh, just dropped off and it was kind of the same story the reason he wanted to get through on horses he had Rubo in a different class coming up to try and split them out exactly and, and it looked like it was going to be a, a really slick move just couldn't quite get the braking done oh boy Rosh West damage and all on that right front corner yeah and that piece I think did come off that's probably what it's from but Ross uh, still showing some good speed, able to get through, make the pass on John Horsch. Horsch tried to counter it a little bit, but Ross covered him in turn 10. Yeah, watching these cars bounce over that curbing there. They've been doing it all weekend long. It speaks to what a robust car this is. Sleek and stylish, but also tough. It's yes. a pretty unique combination. Oh, big rotation there from John Horsch. As now he's trying to fend off Brian Davis right there in that multicolored car. Tends to run different color wheels, too. And Davis now that Ross is through. He's going to see what he's going to be able to do here. This is going to be interesting because, you know, we talked about Ross needing to make up some five seconds to get to Rubo. Well, that was actually Rubo to get to Cagnazzi, but Ross now uh, is in a position where he might be able to challenge. It looked like Holden overran turn one again. Boy, he is pushing hard, Brent is. Uh, but we've got a battle for that fourth spot now in the Trofeo Pirelli category. So we watch Davis here as he continues to work on Horsch. One story to update, it appears that McCarthy is in the pit lane. He's dropped a couple of laps, so maybe not all quite right with that race car. And, man, what a disappointing weekend this has turned into for him. Well, it's his first weekend running in the Trofeo Pirelli Am category after dominating the opening four races and two events uh, in Copa Shell. He deserves to be up here. You know, before he had the incident yesterday, he was showing he had all the speed, qualified third. He's fast. He belongs here. But every once in a while, you have one of those, of those weekends where it's just an exercise and frustration and character building. Well, that's right. So you're, you're trying to take the positives away from it. And, and one good thing for him is he does carry those points over from his previous class to the new one. So um, while this is not going to be good, he has three wins already on the season just in a different class, but all of those points still pay now after the promotion. So he should still be very much in the mix if, uh, if he can get a good recovery from here looking further down the line this season. Yeah, it's important uh, yeah, to note, as, uh, as you said here, it's nice, uh, you know, I mean, when you get moved up, you, you know, what you've done just isn't erased. Right. And that's really nice. And people look at it and go, yeah, but look at that lead he's got. Well, you're in tougher competition now, and uh, so that lead might be chipped away. You don't want to see it happen with two races like this. Yeah, you know, it's one of those conundrums that a lot of series deal with. And frankly, I think this is the the most clever solution to that problem and, and just going ahead and applying those points and letting the races play out from there there's really not a, a totally satisfying answer to that conundrum but this to me does does seem to make a lot of sense well and they've done it you know for a while and it always seems to play out yes that guy if he's good uh ends up in the battle for the championship in his new class but then you've just proven that well then he deserved that and uh, should be up there. So, yeah, I agree with you completely here. Uh, McNeil 
continues to stretch his margin over Jordan Workman. Sada Musial, that is just about a second. There it is. There's Sada. There's Musial. That close. That's about as far apart as they've been all I weekend know. long, too. It seems like they can't uh, escape one another. And clearly two competitors that have a great amount of respect for one another in speaking to them both. And, and some of the racing we saw between the two yesterday speaks to that. You can't pull off some of the moves that we've seen from them all season long, frankly, without that mutual respect. I think it says a lot about the uh, the skill set of these two, Sada and uh, obviously Musial, that they've kept a driver of the caliber of Chris Cagnazzi behind them for this long in this race. Uh, Chris, of course, has done some pro racing in the SRO World Challenge America Championship last year, and uh, he's got that level of experience. And they're hanging right there. And then here's Aaron Weiss, who fi finally, as you said, has that little bit of breathing room, and he's continued to just close a little bit on Cagnazzi. You know what? He's about to go on the attack, I think. He's running this group down, it appears, and that will be a, a welcome change of role for him after playing defense. It seemed like the bulk of race number one yesterday. And he's been a great addition here, and it, people that have tuned in before, and he actually said it in the interview you did with him on the podium, talked about Neil Gahani. And this is the car that Neil runs and that he's had Aaron come in to represent the Concourse Club. And uh, I think Aaron has represented rather well. Yeah, no complaints so far. This has been a, a really well-judged race to this point for Aaron. And, you know, there, there's still that outside shot. He could run down Sada unusual. They're not that far up the road. Just a handful of seconds, frankly. And at 12 minutes, not a ton of time, but it doesn't take much. And we've seen some unpredictable things occur through uh, two races and change so far. That we have here. Good look here at the young man, the 21 of Jordan Workman. Again, there's some family heritage in Ferrari Challenge. His dad ran it uh, a number of years ago. This is his first season in it. He's got experience in some high-performance machinery. He was a test driver of sorts for a company uh, that took really high-end sports cars and put on aftermarket performance enhancements. And uh, Jordan uh, did a fair amount of lapping in those cars, but this is his first outright racing experience uh, and has acquitted himself very well. Uh, in the testing, the uh, Ferrari Challenge management immediately realized, yeah, this kid, he may not have any real race experience per se, but he's got speed, and up he goes. And here goes Rubo as he has now found his way around Alfred Caiola. And Rubo now has moved up into the seventh overall spot, still fourth in the Trofeo Pirelli category. And uh, Rashi West has hit the pit lane. Nah, it's too bad. Not, not what we were hoping to see. But again, had that contact earlier, we were wondering. I mean, it was pretty clear there was damage right. to Ross's car. Frankly, it was more apparent than whatever happened to McCarthy. But uh, yeah, both of them appear to have gone by the wayside here with 10 minutes to go. an eye on this battle here again not uh, a class position battle but a pretty entertaining one and we'll see if Rubo now has what it takes to run down Cagnazzi uh, that margin let's see 23 to 20 it's about the same still about those five seconds and uh, the problem for Rubo now is uh, I think his job gets a little bit tougher because to get to Cagnazzi he's got to get around Aaron Weiss and we watched uh, Aaron keep people behind him all day yesterday yes he <laughs> acquitted himself quite well in that role has some practice and experience he certainly is familiar enough with this track layout now plenty of track time on these weekends anyway but in racing scenarios where you need to position the car to appropriate appropriately defend right make sure you're not giving an advantage to the trailing car i think he has that pretty well mastered with all the experience he gained yesterday yeah, absolutely and uh Look at Holden now as he's coming up. This is on Horsch. Realized he was a little bit too far back. So Brent has, uh, after a couple of times, just running a bit wide one. One time, big time, when he had to take the, the uh, cut through road. The other time, he just ran wide. But Horsch, he's done that a couple of times. He really tries to turn in and use every bit of curb and maybe a little bit more in turn 10. And I've watched him. As a result, it unsettles the car, and you get that wiggle. The problem is you need to get through 10 well because that long bending turn 11 is just a flat chat piece of real estate. And uh, when you struggle out of 10 like that, you're just slow through that whole run. 
So I'm sure that the uh, coach on the radio is going to be telling John, not quite so aggressive a turn in on 10. And in the, uh, in the heat of the moment in, in the race, especially when you've got somebody as persistent as Holden behind you, you tend to uh, do whatever you think you need to do. A little wide there. Holden not quite in position to do anything with it, though, Ryan. Now, you've seen Holden take a, a lunge at him in that turn before, so I wonder if he was taking a look out behind him just to make sure everything oh. was fine. Oh, my oh, goodness, what a save. It's entertaining, that's for sure. I'm not Ooh, sure he's Holden. as entertained as we are. Yeah, true. Holden, uh, I think uh, just he had such a head of steam built up there, he realized I'm going to have to go all the way over that curb. The problem is, is on the back side of that curb, you've got two issues. One, if you catch the back of that curb wrong, it can damage the tire. But two, look at all those marbles that are sitting off there. And it's going to take Brent a few corners to clean those tires off. A bit more circumspect through 10 that time for Horse. Yes, not quite as sideways as we saw <laughs> on a previous tour of the circuit. He's doing a really nice job here. He's been in the game for a while, made a, several appearances in, in Ferrari Racing Series. I believe he actually did some racing overseas in International GT Open, maybe even scored a podium yeah, if true. my yep. notes aren't lying to me. So uh, he's got some experience with this, and it's on display at the moment. And speaking of displays, what a display this is for... Cooper McNeil way out ahead, 20 seconds nearly the advantage over second place. Yeah, we were wondering whether, ooh, off by Musial here. And that, of course, that battle for the lead in the AM category. We'll have to wait and see what happened. It looked like that was down in turn one, and uh, maybe he was close enough. Just pure speculation, and, well, let's see. Let's see if we can see what happened here. Nope, all by himself. Just got in a little hot. There goes Vice, so Vice at that now jumps up into second. Musial able to get going again before Rubo came through, and for Musial, that was huge because he now needs to put his head down and see if he can get back to Vice. And then we get to watch, I think, what, uh, you know, in chess, there's the legendary players have their own moves. So I think this is going to be, after this weekend, we've got the Vice defense. <laughs> I like it. Very funny. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see what he can do. He, he certainly has it mastered, it, it would appear, after yesterday, and, and he might have to break it out once again. Well, Musial can be relentless, no question. Now, And the best thing for Vice right now is for uh, Joe Rubo to really get in Musial's mirrors. See whether uh, Musial boy, he is absolutely on it, using up every piece of racetrack through turn 14. He had dropped about a second and a half off the class lead just before that that little spin, if you can call it that, missing the braking zone in one. Sada had opened it up a little, and uh, I wonder if maybe he was really digging deep, trying to get back up close enough where the draft can play an effect and try and drag him back up into that fight for the lead. Well, one of the things we've talked about is this new uh, Pirelli P0 Slick. Um, has a little bit more consistency over the entire race distance and sometimes that can give you a little false sense of confidence later in the race where you, you think well the tire you know it's been good I'm gonna push it and then you find out well it, it's it's more consistent but if you work it too hard it still is gonna feel the effects and Dave I've been watching him like is, is a turn into one that last lap is a little bit of a slide as he was doing it he's really working hard and that's putting a, a some serious load on these tires here. Well, they have been up to the challenge, haven't they? You know, oh, been truly. Run through the ringer. It's uh, a lot of track time here on a Ferrari Challenge weekend. And it means a lot of Pirelli rubber getting put down on the track there. Is Rubo really closing up on Musial there under break? And we talked about Rubo really wanted to get that good start and drop back a bit. He's recovered some, maybe not as much as I would have anticipated. He's put in some good lap times and would love to make up a couple spots overall, I'm sure, even though that doesn't pay any different points exactly. or anything like that. It's always fun to get an overtake in. Well, and that just works, helps your racecraft, doesn't it? Even if it's not in class, you know, setting somebody up, passing him, getting denied, going, all right, now I've got to regroup. How do I do this? That's all 
good education. I wanted to point out the importance of what's going on here. After qualifying, after yesterday's race and this morning's qualifying, Musial's lead over Jason McCarthy was now four points, uh, with Sada another eight back. Well, Sada right now would get the 15 for the win. Musial, instead of 12, gets 10. Mm. That's a five-point swing uh, for Sada to close in a little bit. And you know Jason McCarthy, when we get to the next round and that car is healthy and he's back after it, uh, this Musial, McCarthy, Sada, and John McGrew will be coming back. He wasn't able to make it this weekend. So for Musial, just picking up one spot here is uh, is a big, big, uh, you know, essentially a four-point swing if he can go from third to second. And that's what he's trying to do. That's Vice up ahead. That's who he's chasing, the silver car. Three and a half minutes to try and, and make that move. The gap last time around was... A little over two seconds, and here when we get him across the yard of bricks shortly, we'll have a better sense for if he's been able to close in at all. Visually, it appears he has. He's put a little distance between himself and Rugo as well, so that takes any factor of what's going on behind him out of the equation. Yeah, exactly. You can uh, figuratively turn the mirrors down, as right. I say, and be able to just get after it here. Cooper, he's not only gotten after it, he's gone. Uh, 22 and a half second lead right now. Sada impressively has stayed within two seconds of Jordan Workman. Tells you uh, the job that Sada is doing right now. But Cooper, I tell you, he's almost metronomic, isn't he? Once he gets out to a lead, he just keeps clicking the laps off. Uh, one of our storylines this weekend was the fact that he raced here two times last year in the series. You know, on that weekend, it did not get a win. The only time last year where he ran both races and did not come away with a victory and. Whatever demons he might have been dealing with, I think have been thoroughly exercised yes. at this point. A couple of poles, a dominant win yesterday, and two minutes away from repeating the feat. Yeah, I think he came in just ultra-focused and motivated, uh, no question about that, and uh, has, has lived up to that expectation and just uh, driven absolutely brilliantly here, as has uh, Jean-Claude Sada. And, you know, again, to me it's impressive. He didn't even race at anything last year while he was healing from uh, getting some non-racing relating uh, racing related injuries fixed including coming back to driving at Daytona in half the time his doctor said he should give a, soul, a, a uh, surgery on his shoulder to heal and uh, came back and had a great run there so uh, this is a guy who is ultra focused as well and uh, there's Jordan Workman and uh, you know for Jordan First year in the championship, and he's not going to be on the pace of a two-time champion like McNeil, uh, but he's got to be thinking, all right, what do I have to do uh, to be able to – I can run with Ross. I showed that yesterday. I can run with Joe, and I can run with Chris, but what do I have to do here to figure out how to run with uh, Cooper McNeil? And, you know, going back to – you talked about Cooper last year. Uh, the race he did have the pull, Benjamin Hites snuck around him on the outside and pinched him at the exit a little bit of one. And then drove into the distance. And to Cooper's credit, at the end of the day, we said, you know, were you struggling a little bit? Do you have something off with the car? He went, no. He said, he said, Benjamin was just dialed. He said, I had nothing for him. And uh, it's nice to hear a driver of Cooper's caliber say, hey, I just got outdriven on that day. It's a mark of maturity, it isn't is. it? And, and he's been around the scene for a long time. So we forget Cooper McNeil is... He's still a pretty young guy, but he has <laughs> a lot true. of experience uh, racing just about everything as the white flag flies. One lap left here in our race weekend for Trofeo Pirelli at IMS. And that gorgeous 488 Challenge Evo. Look at that. It's just, you know, the car was absolutely beautiful before. It remains beautiful, but now it's got that little bit of a hot rod supercar, even more so look to it with... Uh, the work they've done in the front of the car and some of the reprofiling on the back of the car for the aero. Uh, it's just an amazing package. And uh, one thing hasn't changed, 670-plus horsepower out of that uh, V8 twin turbo in the back here. And it, this is now, it was a great race car before. It's an exceptional race car now. Everyone says it's a real joy to drive, a real thrill. You've got all that power. You've got some aero on it. It's just just a blast and, and you get guys with Formula One experience talking about how much fun they have driving this car around a, a racetrack and I think it speaks volumes to the package that they put together. Absolutely and for Cooper McNeil through turn 11 into 12 for the final time of this Indianapolis double round of the championship 
And if he can negotiate these last couple of corners, and you know he's going to be taking it just that little bit easy here as he comes onto the front straight. And he's done it. It looks like he can roll to the finish line. This is six straight triples to start the year. Pulls, fast laps, wins, Ryan. Maximum points through three race weekends. Can't do it any better than that. He knows he has to maximize him while he can. He will be missing at least one race, possibly more, depending on his other racing commitments. And he's doing his best to soak this thing up well before we get to any potential missed rounds. Yeah, absolutely. Meanwhile, here comes Jean-Claude Sada. And what a race he has put together here. Uh, finishing close behind Jordan Workman, who's second overall in a Trofeo Pirelli. And there is Jean-Claude Sada as he comes through and puts up another win on the year. Wow, what a great story for Jean-Claude. It's actually his first win of the season. No, it's his second win. He did have a win at Road Atlanta. There's Jordan Workman, and just a nice job. But uh, Jean-Claude Sada, again, third in the points coming in to this particular race. And he's going to make up uh, a handful of points on Dave Musial. And that's what his mission was here, and he has done that. Musial will finish third behind Aaron Weiss, who uh, once again has been just an absolute revelation, doing a superb job. Uh-oh, I think it might be donut time. It is. Cooper's having a little fun celebrating out there. Got that yellow Sabelt glove out the window. Yeah. A double win at Indy. You want to do a little celebrating, and so he does. Absolutely fantastic. We'll have the the results coming up shortly, but uh, Keg Nazi ends up on the podium with a fourth overall finish. Podium in the Trofeo Pirelli with Joe Rubo fourth in Trofeo Pirelli, seventh overall, and then Shuest uh, will uh, end up fifth, but well down the order after having that problem and that pit stop. And uh, Alfred Caiola will end up fourth in the Trofeo Pirelli Am category. And Brian Davis, fast lap of the race in fifth. That's what he needed. He would have loved to have finished a little bit higher, but he certainly showed speed, and uh, that will be a little bit of salve for him uh, for an otherwise uh, somewhat difficult weekend, and he'll be delighted about that. Of course, all these drivers have a little bit of time now to think about it. It's uh, almost a month before the next round at Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas. And the teams will have all that time to tweak on those machines a little bit. And that's going to be really cool. So let's take a look now at the uh, provisional results. McNeil, Workman, and Christopher Cagnazzi, the podium in Trofeo Pirelli. Jean-Claude Sada, third overall. Aaron Weiss and Dave Musial, the podium in the Trofeo Pirelli AM category. And then Rubo, then Alfred Caiola, and Brian Davis complete the uh, top five in the AM category with Rubo and Schwest completing the top five in Trofeo Pirelli. And uh, obviously Jason McCarthy after that contact from Ross. And uh, Ross, because of that contact, both of them ending up in the pits at the end of the race. And uh, look at that. There's Cooper McNeil. And you know he is delighted after not tasting any of the uh, victory celebrations here yet last year. Uh, he got that off his back yesterday, and uh, Ryan has reported that he jumped out of the car, got a cell phone, and first thing he did was took a picture of his car number at the top of the pylon here at uh, Indianapolis, and uh, now he's got two in a row. Let's take a look now at the provisional points after the sixth race of the championship in the Trofeo Pirelli category. Cooper McNeil doing what he needed to do, and with Ross Schwest struggling a little bit and Rubo finishing down the order, McNeil has a big lead, which he needs to be able to protect when he misses the, that round later on. And then uh, Shuest, Rubo, Workman, and uh, Kegnazzi with uh, his podium finish now um, is going to uh, keep himself within sight of Jordan Workman in this great battle as well. So nice run there. Boy, great look at the uh, Indianapolis skyline in the background and the home of the... Colts there off to the right. Now here are the uh, AM points, and uh, this is what we were talking about now. Dave Musial with 71 points, Jean-Claude Sada with 66. That's only five points, and Sada started the day 11 points behind. So that's huge, and Sada sneaks by McCarthy now for second in the points. McCarthy third, the absent John McGrew still third, and Brian Davis 
uh, with that top five finish, uh, moves him up the order. And Aaron Weiss, boy, talk about having a strong, strong uh, weekend here, uh, has moved himself up into points contention as well. And uh, he's got to be absolutely delighted, uh, Aaron Weiss is, with how that unfolded. He did run, of course, at Road Atlanta. And so he backs it up that with a weekend like he had here, he's right in this thing. And here's a look at the rest of the points here. And let's go back now and take a look at some highlights from the sixth race and second of the weekend in Trofeo Pirelli. And Trofeo Pirelli Am and Cooper McNeil from his sixth pole gets the drop on Ross West. And it looked for a minute there like Workman was going to try and get down to the inside. And then hits that curb, dinks into the side of Ross West. And uh, the rest of the field, some exceptional driving not to collect him here. Brent Holden went on the tack on John Horsch. Couldn't quite make it work down into turn seven, but his attacks were going to continue. And then a couple laps later, tried it again down into turn one, then thought the better of it and tucked in. But watch this move here. Comes from a bit far back and could not quite get it slowed down. Horsch followed him almost and left the door open. And then after some contact between the 25 of Shuest and uh, Jason McCarthy, you see the damage on the front of Shuest's car. He started to mount a little bit of a charge to the field. And Holden tried it again. Nope, not going to work there in turn seven. Follows back in into position here. But these two guys, brilliant save here by John Horsch. Carried a bit too much speed in turn four. Hung on to it. And Holden hit that curve a little too hard, loosened him up, ran wide, and ended up getting a bunch of junk on his tires. Took him a couple of uh, laps to clean that off. Meanwhile, up front, Cooper McNeil was just cleaning the field off here with a, a brilliant drive and earning his sixth straight win and his sixth straight fast lap on the way. Keep in mind, fast lap and poles, those each pay a point. So as a result... Uh, Cooper McNeil has parlayed that points margin up into a substantial lead. As round six of the championship here at the third round of the series at Indianapolis for Trofeo Pirelli has come to its close.